Hi everyone, good evening and welcome to this evening's West Cork Literary Festival event. My name is Imura Hurley and I'm the Festival Director of West Cork Literary Festival. This evening's event is a partnership with Dira Press, a small award-winning publisher based in Connemara. They publish high quality Irish poetry and short story collections with an emphasis on emerging writers. And this evening's event features two of the poets they published this year, Colin Hassard and Dimitra Exilus. And they will be in conversation with fellow Dira Press author, William Wall. We have a full schedule of events throughout the month of July, and these are now on our website, westcorkmusic.ie forward slash LF program. Our virtual events are a mix of live Zoom events like this one and events pre-recorded in Bantry. And many of these events will be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. We hope to see some of you at these events and we look forward to gathering in Bantry again soon. All of our events are made possible by the support of our funders, the Arts Council of Ireland, Cork County Council and their Library and Arts Services, Falcha Ireland and the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union. The books featured in our festival events are available from Bantry Bookshop and we would encourage you to support them or your local bookshop wherever you live. So this evening, Colin and Demetra are going to be uh, reading from their poetry collections and will then be in conversation with William Wall. Um, William has published four collections of poetry, six novels, three collections of short fiction and his fifth collection of poetry, Smugglers in the Underground Hug Trade, Journal of the Plague Year, will be published by Dira Press in October 2021. He is the first poet laureate of Cork, his home city, and he was the first European to win the Drew Hines Literature Prize in the USA in 2017. He holds a PhD in creative writing from UCC. His work has been widely translated and he also translates from Italian. I'm now going to hand you over to William and he will introduce you um, to Colin and Demetra. And I hope you all enjoy this evening's event. Thanks, Emer. And good evening, everybody. Um, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to begin with a poetry reading by each of the poets. And then we'll have a discussion, a chat, a conversation, and some questions, hopefully, from you in the audience afterwards. Uh, we're taking the uh, reading order as alphabetical. So we're beginning today with Colin Hassard, who's a poet from Bambridge, County Down. Uh, he was runner-up in the Seamus Heaney Award for New Writing in 2018 and shortlisted for the Aurevo Northwest Words Poetry Competition in 2019. As a spoken word poet, Colin has twice been Ulster Poetry Slam champion. He was joint winner of the Cursed Murphy Spoken Word Award in 2020, as well as a former winner of Poetry Slams at the Belfast Book Festival and Belly Laughs Comedy Festival. Colin has performed his work on Sky One and has written commission poems for BBC television and national advertisements. He was writer in residence for the Northern Ireland Human Rights Festival in 2015 and poet in residence for all three series of BBC Radio Ulster show Science and Stuff and has an ongoing creative residency with the Duncair, Duncairn Centre for Culture and Arts in Belfast. So welcome Colin. Thank you, William, and hello, everybody. What a pleasure it is to be joining you. Uh, normally, I start these virtual readings by saying greetings from Belfast, uh, but tonight I'm actually saying greetings from Manchester. Uh, I'm over here in the northwest of England, uh, and I'm treating this as both a English and an Irish tour at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, the poem that William mentioned, that, um, the Seamus Heaney Award in 2018. So uh, I'm going to start with the poem that was the runner-up in that award for new writing and it's called A Storm Will Come. Because the mid-Atlantic air is wet and unstable, a storm will come. Because of the hemisphere and time of year, a storm will come. Because our island is acquainted with turmoil, because the seeds were planted upside down and the branches grew as roots, a storm will come. Because there is never a dress or glass slipper to fit, a storm will come. Because a red brick bungalow with an attic full of decades is not your desire, a storm will come, because you are terrified of breadsticks and hummus, because your father is slowly giving up his fight, a storm will come, because the moon summer salts through rosé wine, a storm will come, because sleep is like silence after a punchline, because the Iberian Peninsula holds too many mysteries, because St. Judith has your looks but not your callousness, because you are a coward, a storm will come, because Guevara is dead on his motorcycle scrap, because the war is lost and the trading route closed, because the entrance to the abattoir is spread with perfume, because I wrote love letters on the sand as you waited for the tide, a storm will come. 
So there are two reasons. Well, technically there could be three reasons why I'm in Manchester. Uh, the first is that it's my wedding anniversary tomorrow, uh, three years happily married tomorrow. And the other is that we wanted to get out of Northern Ireland because uh, it's the silly season as we call it up north. So we just kind of wanted to avoid it. Uh, and whenever we booked the, the trip, we didn't actually realize we flew in on Sunday. We didn't realize that there was a possibility of football coming home, which of course didn't happen. Uh, so um, I'll say nothing about that. But uh, this poem that I'm going to read now references the second reason. Uh, and this is called Berries and it's written about my childhood in Banbridge. If youth has a colour, it's most likely white. Bright white like the snow-covered fields in the Finnish winter that play tricks on the mind. Day is night, night is day. Things last forever. My youth is more the colour of blackberries. The kind I was forced to pick from wild hedges by my grandmother who feared the school holidays would bring the devil's work into idle hands. Standing together on the country lane, she demonstrated how to clasp the berry between the forefinger and thumb as if you were about to straighten the tail of a pig and then twist, which was easier said than done with my hands slipping out of my father's gloves each time a berry was dropped in the bucket. Everything was ill-fitting. The gloves, the hedges, the weeds, even the sun felt like it was suffocating the sky. Everything except my grandmother. She dropped berries into her bucket with the pulse of a distant lamb egg drum, humming to herself like she did through each chore. Later, she'd sing while boiling the berries in a saucepan with cooking apples and lemon juice to make bramble jelly. They say in ancient Greece that the first offering of every feast was presented to Hestia, goddess of the hearth and family. How improper that my grandmother's spoon was often bequeathed to me, for I would grumble when there was work to be done. I recall lifting a berry from the bucket and holding it up to the sun. Uh, so I mentioned my wedding anniversary there and my wife is actually from Finland. And when we started going out, uh, there was a bit of tension at the start because we didn't realize that when Finnish people say half six, for example, they actually mean a half hour to six. So whenever I said, I'm going to phone you, I'm going to pick you up, whatever it is at half six, half seven, she was expecting me an hour earlier than what I had planned. And that caused a bit of confusion and a bit of tension. Uh, so I wrote this poem and it's, it's in the only poem in the book that's uh, dedicated to her, but she was a great support through the whole writing of the, of the book. And it's, this poem is called Calling. I will call when you least expect it. I will call unsure of my opening words. I will call long distance. I will call through your letterbox. I will call because I can, because you were the first person I thought of, because I wanted to hear your voice. I will call to kill 99.9% .9 of the negative thoughts in your head. I will call in case no one else does, and in case someone else is tying up the line. I will call from the pew. I will call from the confession box and pray that you don't answer. I will call from a street corner because people no longer listen to the man on the mountainside. I will call the shots with your permission. I will call the ambulance. I will call the midwife. I will call from the trenches and ask you to call the cavalry. I will call you Betty and Betty when you call me, you can call me whatever the hell you like. I will call through the white noise of night and again before the crack of noon. I will call the police to report that my heart has been stolen. I will call when I have your number. I will call when the time is right, when you most expect it. But the important thing is, I will call. And uh, that poem kind of uh, uses some of the techniques of spoken word poetry, which is kind of where I started out into the, in the performance scene in that it has repetition and it builds up this anticipation and this tension. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, another poem for you, which is kind of along the lines of, of spoken word. Uh, as I was very lucky to win the uh, Cursed Murphy Spoken Word Award last year at Wexford's, lit the Wexford Literary Festival. And spoken word isn't something I do a lot of. Uh, at the minute, I kind of feel like I've got this new challenge with page poetry, uh, but I still write the odd one just to kind of make sure I can still do it. Uh, and this poem is called First Will. Being of relatively sound mind and body, this is how I want my particulars divided in the event of you know what. Poetry books, 
hand them out randomly to the people in the street, but not businessmen or pretty women that charity fundraisers try to rattle bank account details out of. Give them to people leaving job centres or huddling at bus stops on January mornings or to buskers, especially those with animal companions. Clothes. Take the shirts back to the second-hand shops from which they came and don't wash them before you do. There'll likely be a shortage of water or a tax on it. Plus, I like the idea of some young fella smelling, smelling like me as he chats up girls or guys. My shoes are to be used for plant pots. Donate the suits and blazers to a homeless shelter. See if people treat them with more compassion now they're dressed in various shades of pink and turquoise. Records. Play them one after the other with the speakers at an open window. If any passers-by inquire about the artist, give them the record. If they complain about the noise, take the record and break it. My notes and journals can go on the fire. There is nothing more to say except that my handwriting is not for posterity. Should we be in a new age, however, where space travel is a common occurrence, put all the papers in a rocket and blast them upwards. If my soul is nearby, I will intercept the craft and continue what I started. If not, if not the rocket will burn up on re-entry. Either way, beware of poems falling from the sky. Um, the only poem that I wrote in lockdown, about lockdown, was shortlisted for the Shima Sini New Writing Award this year. And I don't know, but maybe I had like a mental block where I just I couldn't write about it while the experience was still going on, but I managed to, to squeeze out one poem about uh, the situation and it's called What's Left. And it starts off kind of in a dark place, but I wanted to put in a little bit of hope and positivity and light towards the end. Let's call it hope or something like it. Salvage from the flood of the year, hung, dried, examined in daylight. The sky was temperamental, but it too has survived. Let's call it luck or something like it. Beneath the water, flowers pierced through bandages of weeds and prepared for an explosion of air. Let's call it noise or absence of silence. When the surge rolled back and people arrived with mouths fluttering like a harmony of bird wings. Though the imitation of seasons continued, so did they. Let's call it truth or at least glisten chunks of it. Carved by the wounded into bark until the blunted knife dropped among curl leaves where love or something like it was concealed where petals from the flowers, leaves from the trees, the sky, the seasons, even the, even the people would fall in a drought of kindness. Let's call it strength or what was needed to watch the clock for the precise moment night turned to morning, to resist the urge to swim out against the charcoal flood for the first glimpse of a fingernail of light scraping the darkness. And uh, I might just do one maybe two more uh and i'll jump back to this this is my book here i haven't even mentioned it yet the age of the microwave dinner that came out in april through dara press which uh, i was very proud of uh, and i just i love this cover and um, what's inside is up for debate you can make your own judgments on that but uh, i think it's all right and the cover is just amazing uh so the first uh, section of the book has a poem in it um Many years ago, I studied at the Austrian University in Korean, and I used to get the train home every Friday morning back to Belfast. And there was a, an announcement that used to come on the Tannoy system when you got on the train, and it said, this is a through train stopping at Ballymoney, Collymackey, Ballymena, Antrim, Mosley West, and finally Belfast Central. And that, that uh, phrase stuck in my head for many years, and it was about 15 years later that I managed to put it into a poem. And I'll read this poem for you now, which is called On the Platform at 11 a.m. On Friday morning at 11 o'clock, Jenny meets me on the platform of the Ulster University Coal Rain Station to catch the 11 minutes past 11 Belfast train. The 11 minutes past 11 Belfast train from the Ulster University Coal Rain Station is the busiest of the week but the platform is always quiet for the commuters have packed hangovers with the same efficiency as they pack laundry into their bags. They stand underneath the shelter, protected from the weather with stomachs churning and pulses racing from breakfasts of crisps and isotonic sports drinks. And the rain falls, as it always seems to on a Friday morning at 11 o'clock with the train coming and stomachs churning and pulses racing and laundry packed in bags. 
and on the far side of the shelter, Jenny's waiting for me by the timetable board with her hood up. With the rain falling on our hoods up, we can't hear the oncoming 11 minutes past 11 Belfast train. But when commuters start to gather their bags and hangovers, we turn our heads to see the train slowing. And Jenny lifts her arm, pulls back the coat sleeve and checks the time on her watch with the watch faced on the inside of her wrist. On Friday morning at 11 minutes past 11, Jenny and I board the Belfast train and she claims a seat by the carriage door while I lift our bags onto the overhead shelf. The train is the busiest of the week and on our first journey together from the Ulster University Colerain station the only vacant seat was by the carriage door. But it is now our tradition to sit facing the wall with our knees turned inward. As the 11 minutes past 11 train departs the Ulster University Colerain station, Jenny pulls from her coat pocket the latest book that she's reading and hands it to me. When I ask about the two dog-eared pages he says her mother is reading it too. Jenny has never mentioned her father. As concrete pillars alternate with green fields, we play parlour games. I spy with my little eye Balamoni, Kulibaki, Balamina, Antrim all the way to Mosley West where Jenny's mother is waiting. When the 11 minutes past 11 train starts slowing, we rise from the seat by the carriage door and I lift Jenny's bag from the overhead shelf. After zipping her coat, she pulls back the sleeve and checks the time on her watch with the watch faced on the inside of her wrist. And the train is late and stomachs churn and rain falls. And then just one final poem, which is the last poem in the book. And I actually think it was the last poem that I wrote for the book, which is weird because it actually contains the title of the book in it. Uh, but that's just the way that my process worked. Uh, and I'm a man who loves a bargain. I was in Liverpool yesterday and I made a point of going around all the vintage shops, the charity shops, um, hunting for bargains. Uh, so I got a few books and a few different shirts and stuff. Um, but that's beside the point. Uh, so I wrote this poem about that and more, and it's called Freebies on Gumtree. In all fairness, the assorted patio slabs, TV cabinet and used mattress are not the best things. But that's life in the age of the microwave dinner. What's unaffordable isn't needed. What's free isn't wanted. Frugality is key. Think of how your mother saved 20 pence pieces in an empty whiskey bottle tube. Take care of the pennies. This is a lie you won't remember being told. God is not in your image. Surely you'd prefer him to be better looking. Baked beans mixed with fried onions have an extra kick. A playground can be a railway line or a shopping center. Perspective is key. Think of Sunday school and being asked to draw the plagues. Everything except the killings of the firstborn were in color. Green for frogs, locust boils, but black is only for the slimming of families and bodies. Exodus lacks the thrill of revelations, but is better than seasons eight to 10 of the walking dead. Put it like this, 71% and rising of earth is water and 25% of earth's population are Muslim. If they really wanted, we'd already swim with the fishes. Sure, the sun's been doing the same act for years. Circus music is universal. This is a truth you won't remember being told. We're all in this together. Make love last longer than a parking ticket. Forgiveness is key. Think of how your father taught you to skim stones. Some jumped, some sank, all rippled. That's my 20 pence. Now here's the offer. One heart in mint condition, unboxed, collection only. Thank you for listening. And thank you, uh, West, Cork, West Cork Literary Festival for, for having me. It's a pleasure to, to join you. And thanks indeed to, to William for his hosting duties. Thanks very much, Colin. That, that was wonderful. And um, I, I remember when reading your book, uh, being struck again by the 1111 train, the 11 minutes past 11. My wife and I have a thing about that particular minute as well in the day, you know. Um, we have for some reason found over the years that we're almost always together at 1111. And um, when one of us sees the, the clock, we always mention it, you know. Um, beautiful work. Uh, thank you very much. And it's a beautiful book. And uh, at this point, it might not be a bad idea to mention the wonderful Dira Press. Uh, John and Lisa are uh, absolute stalwarts of uh, literature in Ireland and um, wonderful publishers. Um, in fact, and I would go so far as to say among the many publishers that I've had, they're actually the best and definitely the nicest. Um, so anyway, moving on to Dimitra Zidus. Uh, Dimitra is a poet and writer living and working permanently 
in Ireland since 2011. In fact, she's um, she's a graduate in public health, if I remember correctly. And so that must mean the last year and a half has been absolutely fascinating. She's the author, author of Keeping Bees, uh, also with Dillard Press, published in 2014. And her poems and essays have appeared in Gorse, The Stinging Fly, Room Magazine, The Dalhousie Review, and The Real Story UK, among others. She's a finalist in the Malahat Review Open Season Awards in 2014, she was, and shortlisted for the Bridport Prize in 2013. With Patrick Chapman, she's the co-editor of The Pickled Body. In 2019, she was awarded a Markiewicz bursary for Sworn States, a poetry collabor collaboration with Kimberly Campanello and Anna-Marie Nichuron. She's a research fellow in public medicine at Trinity College Dublin, uh, and uh, hence my um, uh, reference to it being a, a fascinating year for her. Um, so, Dimitra, over to you. Uh, thank you, William, and uh, thanks, Colin, for that reading. It was really, really beautiful. And I, can I also just say the train poem, especially, I just found that the momentum and the beat of that was just really kind of, you know, uh, just really wonderful. So uh, thanks so much for that. Um, I'm going to read some poems from my new collection um, by that was published um, this year by Dura Press. It's called me then, u then, um, I would say, don't let the foreign title fool you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's all Greek to me, it can be all Greek to you, but uh, most of the poems are, um, are written in English. So I'm gonna read a few from, from, the, uh, from the collection. So starting with uh, me then. Begin by telling yourself it was worth it because it has left an impression. In time, the impression becomes two words, not, nothing. Together, not and nothing are evident of something. Together, two negatives add up and you tell yourself, it was something. The sound you make draws a circle around it, lets you hold it close. In the ears of others, the potential for misunderstanding is always there of something becoming a some thing. For a split second, you give yourself over to imagining it, the sum of a thing summed up in not nothing. But all it does is bring you back, back to the beginning. And here again, you start to tally it again, come up with zero, a not, a nothing. Fish eye. Focus on a single point. Growing up, I always feared fish, eating fish. All those bones, thin needles holding the fish together on the plate. Like a row of precise stitches, these bones were thick as spider silk. A threading of white on white on white. Fish, plate, and bone reflecting and scattering all the visible wavelengths of light to the point of being indistinguishable in my mother's eyes. Years later, in the back seat of another time, the gray overlap of memory swallows me up and those bones come back. A familiar hold, a white light scratching out all the black in my throat. I try to be like my mother then and pick at the flesh of your sentences. Find, then throw away any word that could hurt me. I fail. So instead, I focus on a single point the whole of my hand wrapped around you, the tightening of my grip like a spider spinning thread around its prey, the tip of your cock bulging between the circle of my index finger and thumb like a fisheye. Morning fragments, soft opening. The hard neck of a living thing yields to a clenching of, yields to a clench. A clenching of fingers, a clench of fingers turning, turning orange, a curled return to orange, a turn in, into a round thing. And every finger turns, every finger is turned until each one returns, returns to segment, rounding round and round until the whole hand turns, returns to orange, round and round, a round thing, an orange thing. Oh, 
an O thing turning, returning and turning into O, like the oranges growing on the trees in the yard we used to play in when we were children. A turn into or a orange becomes a turn into O, becomes a red turn and a yellow turn, a return to yield, a yield of pleasure and a yield of grief and fucking. A turn into returns the body to fucking, turns it back a turn to the return of you and me, a turn of you and a turn of me, us turning, returning and turning into offerings, orange and fucking and oh, 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 you, you drawn into oh, oh, the orange oh, and you offering up. Oh, you, you surrounded by oh, the red and yellow of my, my, oh, my, oh, rounding round the hard neck of a living thing. Oh, yellow, oh, red, and oh, is red and yellow, red and yellow, red and yellow. O oh, is red and yellow fucking pleasure turning into grief, turning back, turning and returning all at the same time in you, you offering up wood. Oh, wherever, wherever and whenever your mother is, oh, your mother, your mother, she needs to know, oh, she needs to know, oh, she needs to know. She needs to know her son is at the mercy, the mercy of O. Oh. Oh, clench, the clenching of O, oh, O, oh, a clenching O, oh, and O oh, in the hard neck of yours yields to a clench, a clenching of O, oh, O, oh, clenched O, oh, a clenching O, 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 and the O oh of my O oh turns back, back into orange segments and orange segments. The orange segments turn, in turn, the orange segments turn and return until they become a return of fingers clenched. In a clench, a hard neck is not hard anymore limp necked, fingers, fingers letting go and the hard neck of a once living thing, not hard, not living anymore, sits limp, limply and limp necked. It sits limply and limp necked in a pot of boiling water in the yard we used to play in when we were children. In the yard where we used to play when we were children, a dead cock sits, sits limply and limp necked like the body, the body of a son, dead cock, dead cock, dead cock, like the limp necked body of the son of God pulled off a cross. Slit slitting the chicken's neck. In time, the hold of an orange tree anchors memory between two points, zero and after zero. As a matter of distance, time is a wide eye the eye sharp to a point. To cut precisely in time is to make a straight line that breaks the circle and creates a divide, a gash in meaning, splitting time in two, into the moment when and the moment after when. In between two points in time, the slitting of the chicken's neck renders a void, an empty space, an O. O, an orange, an orange point in time. In time, zero, zero. In time, a sudden opening between worlds. Um, this next poem is, sits at the very middle of the book uh, and it's uh, called Naranja, which is the Spanish word for orange. And also the Spanish have a really lovely kind of um, saying about soulmates and it's that each person is half an orange, uh, mi media naranja. So this is, I think a little bit about that. Um, naranja, a new zero. I saw it online, a photograph of a change in time, spring. It has turned, come full circle again. I would go out onto my balcony if only I had one, like I did in Madrid. I would draw in the smell of it. I would let the air fill my lungs and I would remember another time, how time took up space there in the left lung and the right one, my lungs opening and closing, softening and hardening in time with my heart. Smell is like seawater. It shocks the body to the point of remembering. Smell is a zero, an agreed upon point. Can't we just agree then that there is a point to remembering, expanding out from zero to another point in time? Imagine time as a curve, 
from a point spiraling out, one long peel. Imagine the time we spent together making circles. We, a word that is a circle, together, another word that is also a circle, and us, each of us, circling out from zero, making half circles with our bodies and curving, the us of one curving into the us of the other, the very peel of time unraveling between two points. You are a round thing and I love you. I went as far as I could for you, everything in me pressed up against the walls. Still, you wanted more. Open a window, you said. Let in some light. The window, my heart. From here, now, right now, if I could, I would send you a whole one, like the one I saw in the photograph, with a note. Look, I would write, our two halves curving into one, this orange, a new zero, beautiful and perfect. Imagine an orange. An orange under your foot, he says. Imagine you are squashing an orange under your foot. My foot pressing down, pressing down, pressing down, in touch with grief, in touch with my feet, in touch with the weight of some God pressing down on me. And the machine says, imagine you are an orange under your foot, pressing down, pressing down, pressing down, down on the body in a machine. My body turned over and turned over and turned over, tilled until the body gives in all yield, yielding orange from orange to breast, breast squashed under the foot of grief, orange to breast, flat-footed in some machine, in some God is less, in some, in some godless machine, squashing breasts, looking up at heaven from machine, squashing breasts, flat-footed like an open hand, staring up at heaven, offering an offering, eleison, I mean, after another offering, eleison, I mean, after another offering, eleison, I mean, all yielding to ground, to breast, grounded in machine, breasts giving in, giving in, giving in, under the weight of a machine like an orange squashed under a foot. Imagine it is like this, a squashed orange, squashed breast, squashed like a squashed up orange yielding underfoot. My foot, imagine my foot as machine keeping me to ground. Imagine my foot barefooted in grief, in touch with the ground, a field where the earth is turned over and turned over and turned over, tilled until field is like an open hand staring up at heaven and the body yields. The body yields to field, to piece of earth under the weight of a hand. The body is a field where the earth is turned over and turned over and turned over, tilled until dirt gives, until the body gives and yields to turn to drill, to drill, to till on earth, all yield to the light touch of a hand in grief, drilling a piece of earth in grief, tilling a piece of earth in grief, turning over a piece of earth in grief. From zero. Consider instead a body that begins from zero, Horis Heria. Imagine then that there are bodies, one body next to another body, next to another body until infinity, and all of them without hands. This is an act. It is the act of lining up the bodies. We risk nothing because the poet risks nothing. To line up the bodies is to make it obvious. The poet wants to speak to us of violence, but we are dense and she knows this. We have come here looking for something more beautiful than violence, and she knows this too. And so the poet offers this language in the currency of fish. To speak of fish is to destroy the hands of others. It is better to imagine bodies without hands the way we think of fish at market. To us, the smell of fish is better. Now, imagine the fish lined up until infinity are the bodies of our mothers. What we imagine next will be guided by this small but otherwise critical fact. And on this, some of us will be affected instantly while others will have to wait for another time. And yet loss is all the same in the end. If we have mothers who are dead, what we imagine will be dead. This is the poet confirming parameters of craft. No poem has the power to kill. No poem can bring anyone back from the dead. Those of us imagining dead fish do, do so because our mothers are dead. And we are happy, happy to imagine our mothers as fish, even dead ones, because it is better to imagine our mothers without hands, the way we think of fish at market. 
To us, the smell of fish is better. Of course, the opposite will be true if our mothers are alive. Take the poet's mother as an example. She is very much alive and is at this moment very near the sea, will only be very near it, never in it because she fears water. Here, the poet stops to make a point. What is important is not that my mother fears water, but that no one is forcing her to leave land. And so the poet imagines a fish out of water because life has limits. At its limits, everything is laid out, one body next to another body, next to another body, from zero to infinity, choris heria. And it is better to imagine bodies without hands the way we think of fish at market. To us, the smell of fish is better than the smell of our mother's bodies, dead or dying. This is how we know the air is full of things. It's in the way fingers curl backwards into palm, the way water becomes a wave and rejoins itself in time, wave after wave after wave until infinity, the way a circle is a circle from seed to small orange to seed, again, a circle, the way a fist is just a circle, the hand holding itself together between the moment when and the moment after when. It's in the way there are always two points in time for seeing how time passes between the hand when it has a hold on something other than itself and the hand when it snaps shut on nothing. A split second in time from one point to another like a sea full of waves, each one just a point away from curling back into infinity like an orange circling back to seed then rising again to a point again, an orange again in time. In time, it only takes a second for the rounded grip to loosen, a second for the hand to unhand it, its hold on something other than itself. One second and infinity for one second is at the mercy of gravity drawing a line down between two points in time. And it's in the way a wave crashes down, returns itself to sea, the way a fist is a hand that holds itself together, now like a small orange, now and an orange, the way an orange, a small one, makes a circle from seed to orange to seed again. It's in the way something whole becomes fragments between two points in time, like the parts of a wave and a circle made of orange segments and an orange holding itself together like a hand curled into a fist holding on to nothing. Mostly though, it's in the way a fragment of glass on the floor catches the light and we see how full the air really is. All those flakes of dead skin and stardust floating in the width of its shaft. I'm gonna finish on this one, um, it's called a constant. Somewhere there is always a circle, a woman contemplating the afterlife. In this language, I say the letter O. In another, O takes possession. Mouth becomes O, O becomes mouth. In this state of becoming, woman is a portal, an opening. A fish lands on the table. Being of the first order of circles, the eye is attuned, can recognize the season, the slow curl, that yellow grin resurfacing. There is no water here, no sea. Here, there is only air. Bodies contract and expand, contract and expand, contract and expand. One contortion after another, after another, after another. The fish sucks, the fish sucks, the fish sucks. All for nothing. Meanwhile, the woman recalls a good fucking. Together, they exist in time, in the grip of a possessive O. The table, made of tree, remains constant. Thanks. Thanks, Dimitra. <clears throat> that was a fabulous reading. Uh, <clears throat> um, I was struck by the fact that uh, both of you, um, in fact, all three of us are influenced by Leonard Cohen. Uh, the, his uh, collection, The Spice Box of the Earth, was the, the first collection I actually paid my own good money for. 
a long, long time ago. Um, and I was wondering, Dimitra, if um, I could ask you first, and I'll come to you then, Colin, uh, because I, I rem remember you wrote an, an essay with an absolutely fabulous subtitle, uh, Why I Will Never Fuck a Man Who Is Not a Feminist, um, that uh, Leonard Cohen was um, very important to you. And also in the same essay, not to confuse issues, but you, you mentioned um, Lorca's concept of El, El Duane, the uh, I wonder if you could talk about both, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, both go hand in hand for me, because when I was 14 or 15 years old, I um, I discovered Leonard Cohen for the first time in an English class. And I read him and I just thought that his work was so sensual and luscious and sexy. And to be able to be confronted at that, by that at 15 in an English classroom, I was very much intrigued and when I found out that he was also Canadian, that also was really, really interesting for me because, you know, growing up in Canada, we tend to always get a lot of most of our culture and most of everything from America. So to, to have discovered that Canada could could have like a superstar, like to me, he, he was a superstar. Um, and I just thought, well, I'm just going to like eat up everything that he's written and just, you know, read him and understand how he writes, what he writes about, the, the sense of the body, the sensuality, the spirituality. And what I find really interesting about Leonard Cohen is that when I read him, I, I can hear myself. So I feel that there's this way that he is that he is neither man nor woman, you know, nor beast. He is just this this way of being in the world that is that was accessible to me and I could hear my own voice in it. And then years later, you know, reading something about him and you know you know how he went from Canada to the UK to Spain to Greece and you know started talking a lot about um one of his, his own inspirations which was Lorca and the concept of duende and when I learned what that was I thought that's exactly me as a writer this idea that it's something that's within us something dark and just quite it's something that when you write it I love there's this line in Lorca's essay on Duende where it, it, it dilates the mind's eye and I always think that that's a really nice way to think of 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 what a poem can do and it and it doesn't have to do anything big it can do a very small thing and kind of explode the world and so for me those two things together just really shaped me and moved me um, as to why I think poetry is such an amazing space to kind of try and write and create in. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Colin, you, you were also on record as uh, saying that you were influenced by, by Cohen. Um, the poetry or the music or both? Uh, both, but it's interesting you say that because um, when I started out creatively, I, I had aspirations to be a musician. Uh, I played in various different bands over the years and I, I enjoyed the process of songwriting, lyric writing, and that actually led in then to poetry. Uh, so, you know, that's that's always been a, an interest of mine and I still I still play music. I still, I recently got a piano, I'm trying to learn that. But um, for someone like Leonard Cohen, he was a big influence. Obviously he became known as a musician, but before that he was well, well regarded and respected as a, as a poet. Uh, and I think I have, I don't, I don't think I have all of his books, but I have quite a lot of his books taking up uh, space on my shelves. Uh, and I actually got to visit Lorca's house too in Granada uh, about 10 years ago, which was really an inspiring uh, trip. And I was traveling around the south of Spain to get an idea of, of where, where he's from and the landscape and the, just the people. Yeah, you you start you you've mentioned the spoken word circuit there a number of times. And we have a question from um, Shane Murphy. Uh, which I think relates to that. Uh, and it's a question I was thinking of asking myself anyway. Uh, he says, um, how does your relationship to your work change once it has been published? Um, you know, uh, once you see it in print, um, is it satisfying, he says, or alienating or neither? Uh, you know, how, how does your relationship change with the printed word? No, it's very satisfying and it's a different challenge for me now to, to try and get work published and obviously getting this book out was a huge, huge achievement for me and I was delighted that Dara Press took a chance on me. Uh, I guess the, there's a, a distance in it because what, when I'm on stage delivering a poem, I have control over how it's delivered, where the pauses are, how it builds, how, you know, kind of just the flow, the rhythm, etc. Whereas when it's on a page and it's in a book and people can buy it and read it, 
um, you lose that control. But I think that's something that all creative people, artists, whatever it is, um, you have to you have to give up that control sometimes. You have to let it go. And people can do with it what they want. Yeah, I agree with you. Really, I think the the reader really recreates the the poem, and, and in a way, you know, from their own experience, writes or rewrites the the poem uh, pretty much once they read it. You know, um, Dimitra, uh, uh, your work is, I, I think, highly visual, um, uh, very much rooted. I I would say in the textual. Um, and on the, the visual, some of the, the um, visual images of the poems are really striking. There's one, for example, uh, for future readers, those who will buy the book on page 28, which is an apparently random scattering of the letters O and I, or zero and I maybe, and the occasional M dash. Um, could, you, could you talk to us a little bit uh, about that aesthetic and uh, what's going on there? Although I should say before I, I finish my question that listening to your reading there, uh, I, I, I could also detect that um, sort of power of the spoken word as well behind some of the poems. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll answer the second part first. And I, when I first moved to Ireland in 2011, like the idea was that I was just gonna spend a year I look back, I realize now what a luxury I just kind of gave myself to spend a year writing uh, poetry and, you know, going out to the, um, to the, you know, the various evenings that, you know, that were happening around Dublin. I was, I was living in, I'm living in Dublin. So there was the, the Monday Echo um, and, and a few others and, you know, kind of, you know, in writing my own work and then be, having spaces where you can get, get up and perform it and realizing that, 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 that way of reading or being able to kind of hold an audience's attention and the physicality of that is just as important as, you know, writing something down on the page and just leaving it there. Like it's, it, to me, the performance of a poem, if you're writing poetry, you have to think about how it performs, you know, on the page, what it looks like visually, what it sounds to say, what it feels like to put the words in your mouth and to put them out into space and how they might hold space in a room and how the audience will interact with you. And you're, you're doing, I mean, I'm sure Colin will say the same thing when he's performing, you know, you're, you're, you're mindful of your own body language, but you're also picking up other people's body language in the room. And that also will affect how you read um, the uh, pieces. And, you know, I'm interested in poetry in what it can, you know, like I, I was actually talking to somebody about it the other day, and I and I think this is coming from my professional life where I work, you know, in, in public health, but also in design and the, the role of design in, in, in supporting health and well-being. And we talk a lot about the built environment. So I think a lot about the poem as the built environment of the poem on the page and what it does on the page and where you decide to put a line break and where, you know, where you decide to have the, the words sit on the page and what they're doing. And I think when I started to write the second collection, I didn't realize how visual it was going to be. Um, I think I was intending to just, you know, kind of explore that kind of compact sitting on the page and, and what something can do when it's there. Um, but then as I wrote, I realized that there was this expansion that was happening and I kind of went with it. And I, I kind of love the, the look of letters and the look of words. And it's a, it's, a, it's a collection primarily written in English, but it is very much influenced by the fact that I'm a bilingual uh, person. I, I'm a, my background is in Greek and it's, it's, the, the Greek is, is there um, just as much as the English is. And in fact, one of the things I was trying to do with the collection was to try to bend the English language to serve me uh, in, in how, I, how I think in a Greek way on, on things. So, yeah. That's fascinating. Um, I, I remarked as well on the, the presence mm -hmm. of Greek phrases just dropped mm -hmm. into the text. And um, I mean, you know, given that the vast majority of your readers are not going to understand Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about that? I mean, what's the, um, you know, what's your motive for for including the, those uh, phrases? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, I I would almost want to be flippant and say I don't care. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's not my problem. Really. <laughs> so uh, I don't I don't I don't have a real um, 
issue with that. I think it's, you know, I think this going back to what Colin said about once you publish something and you put it out in the world, you kind of have to relinquish control. And so this is putting something out and it's not my, it's not my business to help you understand it. If you're interested in what the, what the, what the Greek phrases are, you can, you can, you can look that up yourself. It's the same. I think I remember, you know, years ago, the first time I heard, you know, Irish language poetry, I can't understand it. And if I'm going to understand it, I'm going to have to make the effort to learn what words mean. But but the way that I could appreciate it and the way that I could love it and the way that I do enjoy it is in that presentation sonically. And again, I think it, it's that in itself is I don't have to understand it to understand it. You know, there's that going on as well. And maybe maybe I'm making a case for. Um, non-Irish writers who are writing in Ireland, who are bilingual, who have access to more than one language to say, well, you know, we're engaging with the Irish language. Why don't you also engage with these other languages that I think, you know, in 5, 10, 15 years will also add flavor to what's happening to literature in, in, in Ireland, but also just acknowledging that, that English is a really, in some ways, poor language to to be poetic in, you know, I, I, why do we have to just, I think it's, 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 you know, I think we should challenge the language that we work in a lot as well and force it to do other things. Yeah, I completely sympathize with, yeah. Uh, yeah. with all of that, really. I think we're, mm -hmm. we're much too monoglot in, in Ireland mm -hmm. in, in many, many yeah. ways. Yeah. <clears throat> Colin, there's a, a question here directed at you from an anonymous attendee. Uh, he says, or she says, to Colin's point for writers early in their development, it is difficult to detach the meaning of your writing from the way it will be interpreted by a future reader. I see this as an insecurity in poetic or literary voice. Would you see it in this way too? Or is this worrying about the ways your work will be read ever present? Uh, oh, that's a tough question or a tough couple of questions. Um, I think, uh, is it worrying about the ways your work will be read ever present? Yes, and I can only answer that personally. I really agonize over it if people, if I think people don't like it. Uh, like for example, last month I, I wrote a poem or I, I worked with a school in Belfast to write a poem for their end of term um, celebrations. It was all about kind of what they'd been through over the past 12 months. And it got a great reaction across Facebook and well, social media in general. But there was one person left a bad comment about it and that I, I dwelt too much on that one negative comment than all the hundreds of messages that people said liked it and all the thumbs up and all this and, that, and, and I really shouldn't because I should be secure enough now in my work and what I'm doing. I think well 99% of people liked it but 1% didn't so uh, I wish I had um, taken Demetra's advice of not caring. Uh, and the first question, I'm just reading it again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess it's the same point. Future readers will make of it what they make of it, and you can only write about your experiences and the times you're living in, and, and you know whatever you want to say, get it down, and it will go on up whatever journey it needs to go on, at the present or in the future. Yeah. I agree with you there. I agree completely. There's some wonderful comments there in the, in the comments box. Uh, really positive about the reading. Um, Dimitra, the letter O, or is it the number zero, uh, or both, um, and the idea of circularity figure really prominently in your work. Tell us uh, about the significance of this. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm still working working through it myself of what they mean. Um, uh, but but the O is, I think, to me, it's it's this this kind of beginning and ending all at the same time, and just turning and returning. I think I think if I go back, it's this idea that um, for me and and possibly one aspect of the second collection has been a re-examination of certain things that I had written about in my first collection and 
you know, I think sometimes, you know, you, you write something and you sit down, you know, your style to say, well, the sim, you know, the metaphor, the symbol of, of something is this, and, you know, you, you, you let people get comfortable with that, but then, you, you know, as a writer, you can come back and you can have that be and mean whatever you want it to mean. So, for example, in this collection, the, the O or the, or the orange is, you know, both, you know, representative of um, the fruit, it turns into a hand, it is the breast, it is the body, it is, you know, the, uh, it, it, it moves, you know, and so it's this idea of this, this circularity and this turning and re-examination and this really kind of drilling into what something means to find something else in it. And you realize that it can be, it's everything and it's, it's, it's something and nothing all at the same time and playing with that, with that in between. And I think it, it, it there's, there's O's and there's zeros. I think zero, and I think there was a moment in time where I thought I would title the collection zero, but then I felt that it was too, it was too on the nose, but I actually really love the idea of a zero because the zero is, is, is a void or it's the beginning of something. And to me, there's a, there's a promise in that, in, in what the zero represents. And there's a promise in what an O represents. There's a promise in what a circle represents. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's, it's just something that I feel I've just been really obsessed about um, and probably will continue writing about as I as I continue on. I think I right now I'm like obsessed with oranges and trying to write a full body of work just on the idea of what orange represents. And so I'll be playing around with some of the stuff in this collection. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> orange is something more I would have thought in Colin's territory um <laughs> to, to make a, a very bad pun um Colin, uh, I, that brings me on to a question and we're coming close to the end of our time now uh but the troubles feature very very little in the book and uh, i'm just you know apart from um you know one or two references sadness is too thin, thin to catch for example or uh seen from another country mm. uh, i'm just wondering uh, and they're just very small references really i'm just wondering is that a deliberate decision or or or, or um or what uh, yes and no um you know when like when the good friday agreement was signed in 98 i was six i was just about to turn 16 and i lived in Banbridge, which really was largely unaffected by the troubles we kind of it was a problem that was happening in belfast and dairy to an extent and so on and, and it didn't really like kind of phase us or I didn't really think about it that much in Banbridge and it was only when I moved to Belfast in the mid 2000s that I guess the the concept of east is Protestant and west is Catholic is became more prominent in my mind but um I didn't write about it because I didn't have much more to say about it than what has been written about for many years by poets much better than me uh, but I, I think a Northern Irish poet, it's very hard to to be a writer of any sort and kind of not have it influence you either directly or indirectly. So that's why it crops up, but only only rarely in my work. Yeah, uh, I can well understand that. Um, there's a question here from uh, Paddy Duggan. Oh, mother fish body, it just says. Um, so I'm going to let that be the final um, comment of the evening. Um, uh, thank you both. Um, I, there are two absolutely stunning collections. Um, I recommend them to everybody in the audience. If we were, um, yes, do please hold up the covers. Um, if we were, if we were actually in Bantry, you could just uh, walk in and and buy them, or indeed get them after the reading. Um, but um, I urge you to look them up and get them at your local bookshop, preferably because local bookshops need all the help they can get in these terrible times. And if not, you can get them directly from Dira Press online. Um, if you just Google Dira Press, you'll, you'll be taken straight to their, um, their website, uh, which is a really beautiful website as well. So thank you, Dimitra. Thank you, Colin. And over to you, Emer. Thank you to all of you. That was absolutely marvellous. Um, I hope that all three of you and everybody tuning in tonight enjoyed it um, as much as I did. It was really, really fantastic to hear you both read. Um, 
as Bill said, it's such a pity that we're not all down in Bantry, but hopefully that will happen um, at some time in the future. And it's just lovely to be able to connect with um, with all three of you tonight, you know, um, from West Cork to, to Manchester to Ottawa. Um, and hopefully we'll all be back in the same space together before too long. Um, so huge congratulations to Colin Hassard and to Demetra Exidus for their readings tonight and to William Wall for his uh, brilliant chairing of this event. And of course, to Dira Press um, for publishing all three of you. And I'm really looking forward to, to Bill's Dira Press collection when it comes out later this year. Um, so other than that, I wish you all a fantastic uh, evening, Demetra, and a lovely afternoon to you, as I know it's only lunchtime where you are. Um, so thank you to all of you for tuning in tonight um, and to our, to our brilliant readers. So I'll do the Zoom wave now. Thank you very much. Good night.